is a clinical geneticist in Charleston, and he's affiliated with multiple hospitals in the area. Even MUSC? In, okay. Um, he received his medical degree from MUSC College of Medicine as ha and has been in practice for more than 20 years. Good enough. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> I was, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's fun to come back. Um, I walked on this campus in 1974. There was nothing here. This was a parking lot. This was called G-Lot, for those who can remember. <laughs> And, and, and I was telling somebody that, you know, the Cobert Center was, was, the, was the library. And underneath of it, where the, where the picnic tables were, were a um, fountain, water fountain. And one of the great traditions was that when you pass part one of the national boards, the class, whoever passed would go swimming in, the, in, the, in, the, in those fountains. And of course, they've now cemented them, and that tradition is long gone. So tonight what I thought I would do is um, really talk about how sort of the diagnostic journey. And it's a journey both for the patient and for the physicians. And what I hope to show you today is both sides of the story. Because I think it's really interesting about how we got to the diagnostic process and, 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 and the frustrations that we in the medicine field have, as well as you, the patients. How many of you all have, have been having a diagnosis of EDS? So that's quite a few of you. So hopefully you'll relate to this. Um, one of the things that I feel very blessed about is, is that I learn lots from my patients. So I hope that you will also teach me something tonight as, as um, I'll, I'll probably learn more from you than, than you than you will from me. So let's start with the journey. Of course, if I can figure out how to do this. Well, th this is an old disease. It was first reported in 400 BCE. And it was, it was uh, in a book called, or a, a, a treatise called Air, Water, and Places. And there were, there were these nomads and other individuals who've had what were with, with, with true hypermobility and lots of scarring. Now the scarring was from trying to treat that hypermobility. It wasn't very good. That medicine wasn't back really that really good. But, and over the years, um, you know, as science became much more um, adept at writing things, probably the first real discussion about it is this doctor. He's a Russian. I cannot pronounce his name. I will not, I will not butcher his name. And, and really, this is really what Ellers Danlos probably should be called, because he wrote the first re really report in 1892, and he presented a couple of patients in Moscow at a, at a dermatology um, uh, convention. It's really interesting that, that most of the people who first reported on this were based on the skin lesions. So most of the early reports are come out of the dermatology world. And what he, what he had was a 17-year-old patient with epilepsy, and I don't know what, you know, kind of that, why that was, why that existed, but had fragility and hyperelasticity of the skin, failure to hold sutures, and he also had hypermobility, luxation of joints, and, and some um, other skin lesions that we see in Ehlers-Danlos. So, it, uh, you know, I'll give credit for anyone who can, na who can pronounce that. Um, I surely won't bother to try. So probably that's the, the first person, first real account of Ehlers-Danlos. But we, we all know, that, you know, that, that it's called Ehlers-Danlos, and it's Edvard Ehlers, and he was a Danish dermatologist. And in 1899, he published a, a paper about a patient who had lax joints, hyperextendable skin, a tendency to bruise, and had, and had delayed walking and subluxation of the knees, much like you, you, some of your story that you, you told us. And, and in 1901, he called it a specific entity. He didn't name it, but he, he said this is, this, he found some other patients and he said this is real. This is something that's, that's a, a, a condition. Well, followed by Henri uh, uh, Danlos, and he was a French dermatologist. See, dermatologist seems to be done. And in 1908, he uh, suggested that they had a group of patients that had skin elasticity, fragility, and he thought that those were, that was the cardinal feature of the syndrome besides the hyperlax uh, joints and hypermobile joints. So those are the two people that 
I guess this man thought were the first writers. And this is a guy named Weber, Dr. Frederick Parks Weber, and he's an English dermatologist. In 1936, he wrote a whole treatise about it, tried to, had a whole collection of patients, and again, with skin hyperextensibility, fragility, joint lax, and he's the first one to call it Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So I guess he couldn't pronounce that Russian name either. <laughs> because I surely couldn't. And so this is, in 1936 is where we see the first uh, term called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Well, really, in those days, we only knew of one Ehlers-Danlos, and that was the classic Ehlers-Danlos. That, you know, these are the, uh, you know, as I always like to say, the politically incorrect people today, you know, the circus sideshow people, somebody called rubber band man, or, you know, the elastic lady. Um, you know, the rubber band man could take his arms, hold his hands behind his back, dislocate his shoulders, and bring them over. Or, as in this picture, literally put, make a mask with his skin from his, uh, from his chest. Or uh, this lady can pull her, her other things. Uh, you know, people who could really twist and turn. And they were put in the circus sideshow. That, that, that's how they made a living. And, and, and that's where interesting many genetic disorders were found and written about. It's, it is a classic case of finding really interesting genetic problems because they are, they are different. And I, I can name a million of them, but I, that's a, for another lecture. Um, but as, as, as the uh, kind of the medical establishment really started looking at it, they, they realized that there was probably a little bit more than just the, the classic. And in 1970, you've, you've heard the word Biden. Peter Biden uh, started the first classification. He was followed by 72 by Victor McCusick. And then in 1988, we had the first um, proposed uh, group of, of, uh, of uh, Ehlers-Danlos diseases. And, and that, um, it's, a, it's a, a busy slide. But basically, here are, the, here are the types that people talked about. You know, the classic type, the gravis, the bitis, the hypermobile type, hypermobile, the type, you know, and the vascular, the, the dermatology, the X-linked, all of those were, were delineated in the 70s and 80s. And, and that's the, really the start of the classic look at Ehlers-Danlos. And a, along with that, we also started realizing that they were inherited and giving the inherited patterns for all of those different disorders. So that's, that's the progression. We, we, we identify things, we, we collect enough families to say, okay, what is the inheritance pattern of it? And then ultimately we get to genetic testing. Well, again, I don't think I'm telling anyone any, anything that they don't know. This is, this is a, a really large group of disorders, connective tissue and origin. And it's characterized by abnormal collagen synthesis it affects the skins, the ligaments, the joints, blood vessels, and other organs. It's a multi-system defect. And that's really important. And really important for us to understand that every, every, uh, almost every tissue has uh, connective tissue. But there is great variability of expression. So certain ones affect certain tissues more than others. And even, even within the same uh, uh, condition, there can be great variability. And, and the general rule of thumb is, is when you have somebody with uh, joint lax, soft skins, and easy bruisability, think about hypermobile EDS, because it's the most common. And, and so that's really important to understand that it is the most common. And since that time, we've got 13 different types, a little bit more, a little bit more, um, specific in terms of of what we what we see you know i would say that the you know the one of the problems that i have in terms of genetic testing is is that the insurance companies only want to worry about the vascular eds and they don't quite understand that you need to rule out everything else before you can you can do a diagnosis of of the hypermobile um, but uh, th th those are some of the penance we have to pay in terms of trying to convince people about the differences of EDS. And as you can see, there, there are all kinds of interesting 
different kinds of things. I, I always like the peridonal one. Um, I, I don't know if you noticed on my, my few degrees, I, I, I started out as a dentist um, way back when. And as my wife would say, I'm overeducated and underpaid, but that's, that's a whole other story to say. But, but um, so there, really there is all of these different types, but the most common is the hypermobile EDS. So how do we do the diagnosis? That's, that, you know, I think that's the crux of it. Well, the crux of it is it's, I just say it's not easy. We have suspicion and we have some, some um, uh, critical, or I should say clinical criteria that we're supposed to use. And that clinical criteria is, is this from the 2017. And I'd like to take a few moments to go through each of this a little bit to give you some understanding of where it's come from, the good, the bad, and the ugly about it. So the very first thing is the bite and uh, score. And it's supposed to look for general joint hypermobility. And as, as most of you know, it's, um, you get a point, you get, it, there's nine potential points, and depending on your age and some other little factors, you know, you can be a four or five or, or above five, you're, you're considered hypermobile. And um, if we look at it, but, but let, me, let me go give a little bit of history. For those, um, uh, one, of, one of my favorite things is to understand the history of how we got places here. So this is Peter Biden. He's, he's British. He was a medical geneticist. His really, oh, his life work was in, in uh, inherited disorders of the skeleton and connected tissues. And interestingly, he did his fellowship at Johns Hopkins with Victor McCusick. And for those who don't know, Victor McCusick is probably the father of, of medical genetics. It's a fascinating story. Victor was a cardiologist. He wrote, or he had the definitive book on heart sounds. You know, uh, most cardiologists don't use a stethoscope anymore because they do an echo to find out all the various valves and leakages and everything else. But in the old days, before echoes, you'd listen to a stethoscope. He was the man, Victor McCusick. But he kept on finding these patients, these real tall patients who had um, some major vascular problems and it turned out to be Marfan syndrome. And so he really started looking at connective tissue disorders, and then he got into the hyper, he got into EDS through that. And uh, Dr. Biden was also fascinated when he did his fellowship with this uh, connective tissue and EDS. So he's most famous for the Biden hypermobility score. Well, how did the Biden hypermobility score really come about? Well, it's really not, uh, not his. It started out by Carter and Wilkinson in 1964, and it was supposed to be used for, to determine in congenital hip dislocation whether you had general hypermobility. So it had nothing to do with EDS. And, and, he, was, you know, and he had a, a score that said if you got three or more from the five criteria and affecting both the upper and lower, then you could be construed as uh, hypermobile. And <clears throat> they used the, the classic uh, apposition of the thumb to the forehand, dorsum flexion of the ankle, hyperextension of the elbow, knees, and all the metacarpal phalange joints. All of them, not just one, but all of them. And, and if you got a three or above, you, you, you were, quote, hypermobile. Well, Dr. Biden modified that in 1973, but he did it for a, a black population. He was, at the time, in South Africa, and he was interested in general hypermobility with congenital heart, I mean congenital hip dislocation. And, <clears throat> and so he decided that maybe he didn't have to do all the joints, he just replace it with the fifth finger. And instead of having dorsal flexion of the ankle, he would just do forward flexion of the, you know, of the trunk, i.e. your knees, and, and made a score of nine. There's no data to say whether this is good, bad, or indifferent. He literally just changed something that had absolutely no data to it. So we use a scale for hypermobility that has never really been met, uh, researched totally. And so here's, here's some pictures, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm sure you're all fairly familiar with this. 
you know, the apposition of the thumb, the fifth finger above 90 degrees, the hyperextension of the elbow and knees, and palms on the floor. Um, C over here is the dorsal flexion of the, uh, the, the original dorsal flexion of the, of the ankle. And again, various degrees <clears throat> about um, these particular uh, joints. So, but really, what is, what is the problem? It was, it's a screening tool, first of all, and it has no scientific basis for it. And, and there, there is no scientific basis for the joints that we've chosen. And so, how does it reflect other joints? And, and this is part of the diagnostic process. Let's say you're not very hypermobile in your fingers. What about your shoulders? What about your hips? What about, you know, a, a million, you know, not a million, but other joints we don't even look at? The reason that we continue to use the, the Biden hypermobility score, it requires no equipment and it's fast. That's it. Those are the two, two requirements, which to me kind of doesn't, it's not really all that great. So here's, here, here is really the, the, the crux of the matter. It's a small number of joints, and, and if you're outside that, you know, if you have joints outside that, you, you're going to be overlooked. So are we missing people? Right off the very first number one on our scale was, are you hypermobile? If you don't meet the bite in four or five or six or whatever, whatever number you choose, you can't have hypermobile EDS, and you really could be hypermobile. Then, and then it's an all or none test. You know, it doesn't talk about the degree of, like, some people are, are so hypermobile. I saw a woman today, I, her fingers were as loose as, as I've ever seen anybody. She could literally make her fingers go into, oh, like into pretzels. I mean, re unbelievable. I hadn't seen that in a long time. And, and it just doesn't really give us any idea about how severe you are. Does that make a difference if you're really severe in three joints as opposed to five joints? No, no other. Uh, and and as, as we'll see, there are probably other scores that we might think about using instead of the bite and hypermobility score. This is a fascinating paper. It was in, um, in 2021, and it really looked at the uh, hypermobility and the use of the Biden score. And I've just, just kind, of, um, kind of looked at the conclusion. As, as, as I've already said, it's not the gold standard for testing for hypermobility. It's probably pretty poor. It doesn't correlate with hypermobility of the shoulders, laxity of the joints of the lower limb, then we even even talked about spinal. And, and the, their conclusion was you, you're better off listening to the physician's judgment as to whether somebody's hypermobile or not than using the, the, than the Biden score. So, so, uh, so the 2017 already, I already have problems with in terms of how do we make that diagnosis if we don't even like, if we don't think the Biden score is all that great. So, so here's the Biden score. So number two, we're gonna talk about the, those features, number two. Unusually soft and velvety uh, skin. How does one know what unusually soft? <laughs> do you use a lot of those, you know, skin softeners? You know, do you, you know, do you wash your hands? I, I find it to be, it's so subjective. Mild, mild skin hyperextensibility. What does mild really mean? Now, I can tell you what extremes are. I, we, I showed you a picture of that guy who can literally take his you know, skin from his chest and put it up, but mild, okay? Well, unexplained, unexplained stria or, or um, stretch marks, uh, piezogenic papules of the heels, those are little bumps on your heels. I bet if I looked at this, if I asked everyone to take off their shoes today, those with EDS would have them, those without them would have them. Fairly common finding. Multiple abdominal hernias, um, atrophic scarring. Now, I, I think that this is probably a, a, a true one. I, I like this one. Pelvic floor, rectal and or uterine prolapse in children, men or, or women without, who have not had babies. I find that you know, really, I think it's a very positive sign, but I don't see it very often to my patients. 
dental crowding and high arch palate. I will tell you as a dentist, no, virtually no one knows what a high arch palate is. And today, what everybody who goes to the orthodontist and has their teeth straightened out, how do you know you have high, you know, how do you know? Uh, I, you just don't know. And then you go to arachnodactyly. Well, lots of people have arachnodactyly. The arm to, uh, arm to um, height stand, you know, the, the this, this is an interesting one. Supposedly your arm span is supposed to equal to your height. You know, and in the, in the world of Marfan syndrome, there is really a, a marked discrepancy. Does it translate into EDS world? There's no data. It's, it's all subjective. And then mitral valve prolapse. There's a wonderful article that's come out recently that says maybe mitral valve prolapse is not a, indicative of EDS. Because it's so hard, you know, it, it's really a, um, it's found fairly often and, and fairly nonspecific, and it depends on, on how good you are in terms of uh, your echoes. And the last one is aortic di dilatation. There was a wonderful study recently that looked at a, a large a group of, of EDS patients, and the only patients that had dilatation were the vascular ones. So is, hyper, is hypermobile EDS, is that really going to be a sign? So here we go. We're supposed to have at least five of them. And basically, I see two or three that maybe I, I could live with. So now I've got problems with the biting. I've got problems with, with A, feature A. Now let's go, to, let's go to feature B, a family history. Well, in the world of genetics, as an autosomal dominant, you can, you can get it three ways. Two we, two we talk about, one we never talk about. The first way is you can inherit. It's a dominant. So either your mother or your father has it, and there's a 50-50 chance of getting it. Now, the, one of the problems is, how do I diagnose your mother or father when they live in Pennsylvania? I have to take your word for it, so, but it specifically says they have to meet the criteria. Don't know how to do that. Second way that you can get it, you can be the new mutation. You could be the start of the line. So that, that doesn't take that into consideration at all. The third one, and I joke about this, but it's been a, a little secret in the genetics world that's kind of come out with 23andMe or Ancestry.com, your father's not your father. <laughs> about 5% about of the time we find that. So, so, so I, have, I have A, I'm having difficulty with. B, I'm really having a great difficulty. And C, I think is, you know, reasonably okay in terms of musculoskeletal pain, chronic pain, you know, re recurrent dislocations, you know, dislocations in the same joint. I, I think that these are really um, reasonable ones to do. But how do you do? You, ha you know, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like a menu. You have to have, in, in criteria, you have to have, you know, uh, you know either, you know, you have to meet A, B, or C. You have to meet two out of the three. And I already have problems with all three of them. Oh, uh, two out of the three. So how do I make that diagnosis? So from a medical standpoint, think about us trying to try to diagnose you. We don't have a good criteria. And as, as our presenter before me points out, there are all kinds of symptoms. I mean, this is a chart that says these are the kinds of things that people get. And not everybody can get it. And you remember, remember that you, you share only 50% of your genes in common with your, your parents or your children. If your children inherit your EDS, their other genes interact with those. And so we have great variability of expression. So they may have symptoms worse than you or better than you or different symptoms. It's really difficult to understand. You know, one really needs to look at all of these, these symptoms. And, and that's, that is part of the problem because EDS patients show up to various doctors. Depends on their education, their knowledge base, all of this. So here's just a partial list of, of physicians who may get to be the first people to see an EDS. And half of them, maybe, no, I, that's, that's being generous. 75% of them never had a, a single course or single word about EDS in their, 
entire medical school class. Another 15% probably remember it as one of those lists of rare diseases that you'll never see. And maybe 10% have had some, some experience from a patient. And, you know, and when, a, when a doctor says, in my experience, it means he's got one. <laughs> so, you know, so, so it is so difficult. So here you are with all of these signs and symptoms trying to get to someone who doesn't really understand what's going on. So you can see where the clash is and why, why patients are frustrated and equally is why physicians get frustrated. So I just want to go a little bit through this just to kind of remind you of some of the signs and symptoms. In the world of orthopedics, obviously it's real easy about subluxations and, and dislocations. They're very common, you know, and, 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 and all the sites can be involved. That's, that, that's what's so maddening, you know, the, you, you might go see somebody about your shoulder, but then your hips start going crazy. And, and now you go back to the same doctor and, they, and he goes, Oh, I th are you really having this problem? You know, what, what is really going on here? Are, are, you, are you seeking, you know, medical care for no reason? Sprains, you talked about sprains, uh, you know, the, the snapping hip. One of the major ones that people never talk about is the TMJ, the temporal mandibular joint. It is probably one of the more common joints that is affected by EDS. And that's partly because you use it all the time. You move your mouth, you know, we talk too much, we eat all the time. We're, we're really, it's hard to rest that joint. So, you know, it, should this be one of those criteria instead of some of the other things that we've looked at? And then clearly, as I always say to people, you know, um, you know the, the, the reality is, is that the, the, the most important thing that you can do immediately is Quit showing people how hypermobile you are, how loosey goosey you are. You know, and the reality is is that you you're, you're, you can injure even though you may not have dislocations or or uh, subluxations, you're still still causing pain. And 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 what we see in very young people, unfortunately, is some arthritis changes, and ultimately. The, the possibility of having joint replacement. And for those who don't know, joint replacements are great, but they only last 10 to 12 years. So if you're a 30 year old, you do not want a joint replacement because you're, now you're in a cycle every 10 to 12 years to get another joint. And each joint replacement gets more and more difficult to do. So as, as I always like to say <clears throat> to my patients, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So if we can keep you well, and I, and, I, and I point to my physical therapy colleagues to say they're going to teach you how to move, how to keep, how to do the right movements as opposed to, to you know, overextending yourself. And my other joke is, is, is uh, you know, it's you have to know your own body. You, know, you need to know what hurts, what you can do and what you can't do. And it's the, it's the old joke about the, the, the guy that comes into the doctor and says, Doc, every time I do this, it hurts. And the doctor says, well, then don't do that. And that's really what you've got to do in EDS. You've got to understand your own body to understand what you can do and what you can't do. So that's it's just some of the orthopedics. The big one is pain management. People come, you know, you know and, and, you know, it's, it's that chronic pain. It's, it can be associated with dislocations. It can be long term. It, it can have both physical and psychological problems. And, 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 and typically the severity is worse than expected based on the physical examination. So people that have this and have tremendous amount of pain sometimes are not recognized by our, our physician colleagues as truly pain. Pain, pain patients. Are you drug seeking? Are you looking for drugs? Are you, you know, do you have, you know, and there's a, a whole group of things that we see all the time. Chronic pain syndrome, uh, fibromyalgia, uh, you know, a, a whole bunch of euphemisms for this, for this whole, this, this problem that's associated with EDS. 
And, and you know, there, there are at least three different types of pain associated with EDS, and I, I won't read all of this, but there's muscular, there's neuropathic, and, and there's, there, there's arthritis, ortho, arth, arthritis. And each one's different, and, and individuals with EDS can have one, two, or all three, depending on what joints and, and what, what's going on with them. So it's really important, and again, this is what I, I, I'm, I'm hoping the chip will do, is, is to get us some of the, you know, uh, some true experts that people can, can rely on that understand more about the disease than just treating the symptoms. And that's really my hope for what, what, what CHIP's trying to do in terms of a, of a clinic here. You know, psychiatry, you know, people, people get, you know, when you have chronic pain, you can be depressed. You can have affective disorder. And, 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 and you know, it's a vicious cycle. The more you're, you have pain, the, the worse your depression can get. It, it's, it's a, can be, it can be a downward spiral. And, and of course, lots of doctors don't understand EDS, so they, they feel like you're not to be believed. So now the patients say, I'm not being believed, I'm misunderstood, I'm being marginalized, I'm, I'm all alone with what I've done. And again, what does that do? It, it creates resentment, hostility between the doctor and the patient. And again, it's so difficult to, to manage patients when you don't have a good relationship with those patients. So ultimately, we have to figure out a way to educate our physicians as well as our patients about how to talk about this pain, how to, how, how to really get this out to, to our medical colleagues. Again, <clears throat> if, you, if, you looked, if, if you remember back to the original uh, criteria from 2007, they say nothing about GI. And GI symptoms are really common. 67% of the people have bowel problems. Chronic diarrhea, chronic constipation, alternating uh, diarrhea and constipation. They have, they have motility problems. They have, I mean, all kinds of issues, but it's not on the score. Not even, not even thought about. Um, you know, irritable bowel syndrome. How do we, again, get people to understand that this is a multi-system disorder? You know, it is MCATs, you know, it is uh, mast cell activation syndrome. Where are mast cells in the GI tract? Is that associated with this? Again, no recognition in our, in our world and no recognition in our, in our physician colleagues to think about these kind of chronic problems to look to see, to see what else might be going on. Cardiology. Uh, I have, I, have to, I have to tell a story. I have a son who's a cardiologist. We had a discussion about EDS, and, and we had a discussion about POTS. And, and my son was, I, he's a very well-educated young man, a whole lot smarter than I ever will be. But he was, he was sort of downplaying POTS. And, he, and, he, and I had to educate him about, you know, kind of what, you know, the, the pathophysiology of it and the reality of a connective tissue disorder with POTS, you know? Because, you know, people can faint all the time. There's a very, um, I'm old, so I remember when the queen used to view her, uh, her uh, troops, and they would stand on hours on line in those beautiful red coats in a straight line, and she'd walk down, and after, every once in a while, you'd see somebody lying down. And, and, and what, what the happens was is, is that they pooled their blood in their feet and your brain says, I need oxygen and the best way for me to get oxygen is to make you flat. Well, it, you know, that's, that's sort of what happens in POTS. You know, the connective tissue disorder makes it easier or makes it more likely that you're going to have pooling. The, the, very, the, the, the physiologic effect of not getting enough brain, the very first thing that happens is, is your heart says, I need to get more blood circulating, so I'm going to speed up. And that's where the tachycardia comes in. But, lot, my, you know, again, my son, and, and, and so he's asked me to come and talk to his group about 
about POTS and EDS. You know, Ray knows, how many people have, you know, Ray knows where their hands turn white and cold? You know, again, is that a, you know, is that a, a, a vascular thing? Mitral valve prolapse, one of those uh, characteristics on the, on, on, on column A, uh, there's a, a whole lot of reports that say it's really not necessarily real in, in, in uh, EDS patients. And, and it's, it's just not, again, the, the science behind it may not, it has never really been proven, yet it's on that list. Neurology, neural surgery, you know, we've talked about cranial cervical instability, we've talked about Chiari malformation, which is kind of the, the, the genesis of this group, you know, uh, results in poor balance. You, you know, the, this autonomic fun malfunctions, you know, how many here are, don't you know, have some temperature um, instability, don't like the hotter or the cold? You know, how many, you know, how many, you know, think about, I always think about the autonomic nervous system as our second nervous system. Our first one is our voluntary one. I want to move my hand, I can move my hand. But I don't think about my heart beating. I don't think about my breathing. I don't think about digestion. All of those things are, happen in EDS. And those are autonomic dysfunctions we, may, we don't necessarily think of. And, and in the medical field, we don't necessarily put two and two together. Dermatology, again, as I, as I said, this is where it really started. This is, this is, this is on the easier spectrum, you know. You know, the, the hypermobile skin, I don't know what mild is, but, but I can surely say that that's not mild. You know, you can see the, the, the um, cigarette paper um, scarring. Uh, you can see stretch marks, and th those are the piezogenic um, papules of, of your, of your, uh, on your heel. You know, again, those may be the easiest of things to look for in, in hypermobile EDS, or, or in all the EDSs. Uh, someone talked about GYN. You know, we have, you know, we can have pelvic prolapse, so, you know, uh, we can have Dysmenorrhea, we have lots of women have PCOS, we have uh, dyspruneia, you know, uh, we have increased joist laxity. Remember women, um, there is a hormone called relaxin. Relaxin is a hormone that's produced primarily to get the baby out, uh, loosen up the pelvis so you can get the baby out and, and have a baby. And um, it, it relaxes the joints and, and, and connective tissue. But it also occurs when you're during your menstrual cycle. So many women experience increased hypermobility during their menses. And again, it's something to know to be prepared for. The, you know, the, I, I always tell women, especially uh, young women, I, I said there are, two, there's, there are truisms, two truisms about women. One is all women will go through menopause. And, all, and a large percentage of the women will have osteoporosis during menopause. They'll lose bone. That's just a, a natural occurrence. The second truism is people with EDS are klutzy and fall. The two of them are deadly. Deadly combination, especially in the elderly. So I always remind women that they need to get their bone density after, during menopause and to be much more aggressive in treatment than other individuals. Last but not least, uh, you know, I, medical genetics, I, I, you know, this is an autosomal dominant, but it has great variability of expression. You know, you have the gene, but you have, as a human being, you have between 20 and 30,000 other genes and they can interact with, with that abnormal gene to, to make you different than anybody else. And that's what really makes it significantly difficult to diagnose. There's another expression, another phenomenon in genetics, and that's called penetrance. That is, you have the gene, but you don't express it. Now, there doesn't seem to be very, I've not seen very much penetrance problems in, in, in uh, EDS, but, you know, I'm, I'm like the doctor who said, in my experience, I've not seen enough to really know that. So, you know, I, it's something that I, that I look for. And, and when, when you see penetrance, it's that concept that it skips a generation. You still have the gene, but you just don't express it. So your grandmother was hypermobile. You're not hypermobile, but your kids are hypermobile. 
And again, you have the gene, but you just don't express it. And then last but not least, you know, the importance of genetic testing. And as, as, as we've seen, there are now, for most of the EDSs, known genetic mutations, and we can test for them. But the big one, the one with its most, probably the most prevalent, is the hypermobile EDS. And so we're hoping that someone in this room will, will um, give us the answer to, to, to the million dollar question, is there or will there be a genetic test for hypermobile? Because that will help us. Because I honestly believe, I honestly believe at, here that we, with the criteria that we have, we underdiagnose lots of people and occasionally we overdiagnose. And, and a, a, a test will help us kind of limit those people on the edges. I think it'll help us, especially with the underdiagnosis. I think it's, to, to, for me, the most um, dissatisfying diagnosis I can give somebody is your EDS spectrum. I think you have something. You know, you, you might not have the one from column A and one from column B and one from column C. You might not have that, that, that or you might not have, you know, uh, be as hypermobile to, you know, have a, a five or whatever, whatever age you are. But you've got, you know, you've got your hips bad. You've got your shoulders bad. You have, you know, uh, you have a Chiari malformation. You have cranial uh, you know, cervical instability. But you don't meet those criteria. Can't call you can't call you EDS, but you've got it. I mean, you know, and so, and, and it is very frustrating, I know, for the patients that say, I've come here to be told I have hypermobile EDS, and now you tell me this EDS spectrum? It's, it's, it's a difficult diagnosis for us as well as for you. So I think the future is to get some testing done. And I, I'm, and I tell my patients very optimistically we'll have something that we will be able to add, add that to our armamentarium to help with the diagnosis. So this is my final slide. I believe this, you know, this is what happens in doctors. With all the trees in the way, I can't find the damn forest. And, that, and I really believe that we, and I, and I speak for all of you in this room, have obligation to educate your doctors, as well as I have an obligation to educate my doctors about what EDS is. And hopefully together, we can get uh, you know, better diagnostic and better services for all of you all. And with that, I guess it's my time to take questions.